Well, hello, and thank you so much for joining us for the eighth episode of Reimagined in America. I'm Karobi Acharya, and I lead the Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions team here at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And like many of you, I've been spending a lot of time cooped up in my home, hunkered down as we attempt to slow the spread of COVID-19. And as I look out my window each day, I'm greeted by this. This is my little weeping cherry tree that I planted last year. It's not really magnificent. It's a little bit of an ugly duckling at the moment, but I have to say I found some comfort just watching it. The tree's not affected by COVID and it will live long after me. Growing roots, spreading branches and flowering have all become metaphors and coping mechanisms for me during these tough times. You know, indigenous communities have understood for a long time at a deep level that our lives are completely interconnected with the natural world. But unfortunately, over the years, many of us have lost our connection and for many people, even our access to nature. We've literally paved over nature, filling our cities with miles and miles of concrete and asphalt. As development has sprawled outward, we've built on floodplains and in fire prone areas. But people are starting to wake up to the critical role that nature can play in our health and well being. People are rediscovering the immense beauty and wonder of nature, and they want to be surrounded by it, not just for a weekend here or there, but every single day in the places where they live, learn, work, and play. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, how communities in the US and around the world are investing in nature and the creative ways that they're strengthening residents' access to and connection to nature to boost health and well-being. So I'm really excited to dig in. And yes, the pun was intended. Uh, but for, before we do that, just a, a couple of quick reminders. Um, first, everyone's audio has been muted, but please, you can ask questions at any time using the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. Second, we're recording the webinar and we will be sending that to you um, on Monday. And finally, we have closed captioning available. And you can turn this on by selecting the closed caption button that's at the bottom of your screen. So I wanted to start by just learning a little bit about all of you. So we have two questions that should pop up onto your screen, um, if you can click on the answers. So the first question, what kinds of nature-based efforts, solutions, and or projects are either underway or would you like to see in your city or community? And just please select all that apply. So that, that's the first question. And then if you scroll down, you will see the second question, which is why did you join today's webinar? webinar and select all that apply there too. So I'll give you a, a, a couple seconds to enter your responses um, to both of those questions. And Kyle, you let us know when, when we've got some results to share. Sure thing. We're at about 75%, still waiting on a little bit of people to, uh, to respond. Yeah, I should note, we have, we have a lot of people. We have close to 300 people on the webinar today, which is fantastic. So uh, looking forward to see, to see these results. Still waiting on the last 15 or so percent. Um, we'll give it about 20 more seconds and then we'll take a look at the results. Okay, great. Okay, I'll be ending polling now. So let's take a look at the results. 
All right, very interesting. So what kinds of efforts are either underway or would you like to see? More trees, 65%, uh, biodiversity, 50%. Um, uh, pollinators, I, I love that. Um, birds, aquatic species or mammals, 37% water quality. So the highest it looks like is uh, parks and green spaces. 85% of you uh, are talking about that. And of course, these are all interconnected. You know, if you get more parks and green, green spaces, you probably get more pollinators. And then why did you join? Why did you join today? I want to know how nature-based solutions can promote equity. 78% of, of people, that's why you join. That's fantastic because that is exactly what I want to turn to now. Um, so, you know, as, as everyone knows, COVID has kept us away from many of our go-to forms of entertainment, like movies, malls, barbecues, and basketball, and it's kept us cooped up in our houses, and we're not able to visit our friends or family, and it's only natural that our desire to connect both to each other and to something meaningful has brought so many of us outdoors and into what can one can only hope is a lasting and deeper connection to nature. But in general, as a society, we've tended to see the natural world as an inventory of useful commodities. Trees become timber, animals become livestock. All of them are to be used for our immediate human needs with little attention to the longer term implications for our environment or our health. And as you know, our use can turn into abuse, much like the case of the Flint River, pictured here. For a century, people and factories dumped chemicals, trash, even raw sewage into the water. This pollution contributed to the leaching of the lead from the pipes and exposed residents to high levels of lead, as, as we all know that story. But the tides are slowly turning. In countries around the world, and even in the US, opinions are beginning to shift. Rather than seeing nature as a short-term resource that can be abused, we're starting to understand that it's something to celebrate and to cherish. And in cities across the globe, that hard line dividing the urban world from the natural world is slowly beginning to blur. And that leads us to today's conversation. What would it look like if daily contact with nature was something that we all experienced, no matter where we live? Could our lives be healthier, more equitable, more meaningful? I, I think they could. And today we'll hear exactly how to go about making that a reality with examples from around the world, as well as one from right here in the United States, from St. Louis. And so with that, let me introduce our two fabulous speakers. Catherine Werner is the city of St. Louis's first sustainability director. She's been with the city since 2009, spearheading the development and now overseeing implementation of the city's sustainability plan. And Dr. Tim Beatley is the founder and executive director of Biophilic Cities, which advocates across the globe for the value that urban nature brings to people living in cities. He's also a professor in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning at the University of Virginia, where he's taught for the last 25 years. So welcome to you both. So I wanna kick off things with a few questions of my own, and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. And remember, you can submit a question at any time by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So it seems like nature has never been more popular. We're safer outdoors these days and we're seeing a newfound appreciation for parks and green spaces and the, the, and the role that they play in our health and well-being. So, so Tim, let's start with you. What's going on? Well, thank, thank you, Kroby. It's uh, great to be with you, and, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, well, I think you said it well in your introduction. I mean, we're, we're in this uh, time this, of a pandemic, and if there is anything positive that will come out of this, it's a, uh, a reappreciation, I think, for how important nature is. And, and so we believe in this idea of biophilia, which is that we are, in fact, as human beings, uh, hardwired to, to need and want that 
uh, connection uh, to nature and to lead uh, fully happy and healthy and meaningful lives. We have to have that nature uh, all around us uh, where, we're, where we're spending our, our time. Uh, and increasingly dur during the pandemic, that, that's, time, that's time, a lot of that time has been inside. So um, we have been hearing bird song and have been seeing things through windows, but we've also been uh, drawn to parks, right? And, and uh, outside world. And, and so actually this, these are a couple of images from two of our, our partner cities in the Biophilic Cities Network, uh, Forest Park on the left in, in Portland. And uh, there is an example actually of a, a park that's seen in incredible popularity, incredible usage during this time of, of pandemic and of, of lockdown. And they've actually uh, had to create these sort of uh, one-way uh, trail loops through the park to accommodate uh, all the people. So, so I think if, you know, it is the case that we, that nature has been the saving grace. It's, it's the, the, the balm, the, the sort of constancy and uh, normalcy that we're lacking in other aspects of our lives. So the birds are still migrating and there's something very uh, reassuring uh, about that. Um, and nature is how we're getting through uh, this, this tough time. Absolutely. The birds are definitely still migrating. Catherine, tell us, what, what are you seeing in St. Louis? What's happening there? Hi, good afternoon. Yes, no, I agree. I think it's true. For many people, getting out, outdoors has taken on more meaning during the pandemic. But the importance of nature and our connection to it, of course, isn't a new phenomenon. I like to say that nature needs people and people need nature. We know that people have the ability to help the natural world through things like habitat creation, land management, and scientific study. A growing body of research also shows that there are numerous health and well-being, education, and even economic benefits that nature can bring to people. And through the Biophilic Cities Network, I saw Tim use an example of a recommended daily nature diet, similar to the ones the USDA sometimes uses for encouraging healthy food choices. So I decided to make one for St. Louis, and here you see it. Uh, and a healthy nature diet would include, perhaps at the foundation, daily doses of nearby nature with additional weekly, monthly, annual experiences that are maybe increasingly immersive and extensive. The point being, each of us can realize tangible benefits through daily connections to nature, even if they're small and fleeting. And cities can play an important role in making those opportunities readily available. I love that. I love that, the nature diet. So Tim, even before this uh, crisis, there was a handful of cities around the world that have been working hard to bring trees, greenery, and nature back into the city. And you've been building a network of what you call biophilic cities. So if you could tell us what exactly is a biophilic city and how is it different from a city that might just have a lot of parks? Um, and what is this trend that's taking off around the world? Sure. So, so um, I want everybody to become comfortable with the terminology biophilic cities. And it, it refers to, to several different things. It's a, it's a vision, really, of what uh, a city could be and what cities uh, can be. But it's also a, a, a network, a global network of, of cities. And it's also a global movement, we think. So it's an idea that's really uh, gaining traction. But at the heart of it, is this vision, this different sense of what cities uh, can be and should be. Cities that are biophilic are deeply natureful. Uh, they are places of abundant nature. They're biodiverse. They're uh, cities that share spaces with, with other forms of life. Um, a key aspect actually, uh, actually Catherine mentioned the word immersive. Increasingly, uh, cities in our network are, are saying, we, we want cities where if we don't just have bits of nat nature here and there, not just that park that we can walk to or a few trees here, it's the, the whole city needs to be understood as a natural system. So um, there's an aspiration to, to have that nature everywhere. And, and a really important part of it is understanding how the built environment blends with the natural environment. So our vision of biophilic cities is a room or a rooftop um, to the spaces all around the building, to the urban neighborhood, to the city, and, and beyond. And that actually that earlier slide uh, that you just flipped 
was Helsinki, Hel uh, Finland, and wonderful example of the multiple scales that we that we see that have to be um, considered or thought about in, in, in nature. So here, here in this city, an elaborate uh, network of green spaces in nature, you can move and walk from a, a dense central city all the way out to old growth, growth forests at the edge of that town. And all of these these um, uh, scales ideally are are integrated, and there's a sort of seamless nature, and it's the the again the green roof all the way out to the green or bio uh, region region at the edge of that of that city. Um, I haven't told you a lot about other other cities. There are a lot of cities in our network doing doing wonderful things. Um, and uh, actually, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, that's uh, uh, Singapore. Singapore has been one of our partner cities from the very beginning, and they've actually changed, literally changed the motto of their city, their city state, from Singapore a garden city to first Singapore a city in a garden. So this idea, again, this immersive nature, which is at the core of a biophilic city, um, you know, we want to, to, to be living in the park, in the garden. We won't, don't want to just visit it. Um, but they have recently even gone further and have changed their motto from uh, city in a garden to city in nature. And, uh, and this is um, Park Royal Hotel, uh, one of many biophilic buildings that we find now in, in Singapore. And it's a, it's a wonderful story of a city moving in that, in that direction. It's so beautiful, it's so beautiful to see. And Catherine, St. Louis is one of the cities that's embraced this movement to connect residents and nature. So I'd love to hear how, how you're bringing nature into the city and how those decisions were informed by ideas from other, other cities and other countries. Sure. Um, well, to do that, I'd like to share a quick story, if it's okay. I attended the launch of the Biophilic Cities Network at UVA in the fall of 2013. And among many other things, I was really taken by what I learned about the biophilic efforts underway in Singapore. Um, so a few months later, I actually had a chance to briefly visit Singapore. And so I went there, I popped in as much as possible in that short visit. Racing to catch my outbound plane, I noticed that there was a butterfly house right inside the Singapore airport. Uh, I remember the stress and anxiety I felt after <clears throat> three exhausting days of travel there, and how it immediately dissipated as I entered the butterfly house. Mm -hmm. And looking around me, uh, I noticed that that feeling seemed to be shared. Everyone inside the butterfly house was smiling, engaging with the butterflies. <laughs> it was a clear example of the power of nature, including in a very stressful place. And a, a, it struck a chord with me that it stayed with me. So I brought that back home with me to St. Louis, and I, I started to take a page from that Singapore experience and search for a way to make it easier for people in St. Louis to connect with nature and butterflies. Uh, so while also expanding critical habitat for the dwindling population of monarch butterflies, which are in our area. Since St. Louis has no dedicated budget for implementing sustainability or biophilia, we needed to come up with a very cost-effective approach. The result was Milkweed for Monarchs, the St. Louis Butterfly Project. And this is a challenge-based program. It encourages people in the community to create monarch gardens. And each garden might be tiny, very small on its own, but after just a couple of years of this program, we ended up seeing more than 400 monarch gardens being created and registered in the city of St. Louis alone. So you can see the map of that in the center of this slide here. So building on inspiration from abroad, we found a way to increase local eco-literacy and collectively help increase monarch butterfly habitat along its important migratory path. Thank you so much. I, I, I love this story. I, I simply love the story. Um, it's, it's just the power of what individuals can do in their own backyards and how that quickly adds up to something very impactful. Um, so, you know, with COVID, of course, we've come to see how unevenly distributed parks and green spaces are. Um, and fewer, with fewer of those areas to be found in low-income neighborhoods or communities of color. And recent events have also underscored the unjust experiences that many people of color have in the outdoors. Um, 
We all remember the incident of Christian Cooper who was threatened with violence and arrest when bird watching in Central Park, or even the tragedy of Ahmad Arbery who was murdered while jogging down a tree-lined street in Georgia. So I'm curious to know, how are the efforts to bring nature into cities, more nature into cities, helping to address these issues and um, the, the equitable access to, to nature and green spaces? Um, so Tim, let, let's start with you. What are you seeing around the world? And, and then, yeah. yeah. And, and the first thing I'll say is just, I'd love for everybody to go and visit our website, bio biophilicities.org, and I didn't mention this in the earlier answer, we have 20, 24 cities now in the Biophilic Cities Network, and there's information, there's a page for each uh, city, and, and St. Louis is there, um, and, and there's a lot of information, a lot of material, a lot of films that we've been making about these various cities, but yes, um, equity is really a, a key dimension to, to, to the story and to what a, a biophilic city is, right? We we believe that nature is not something, something optional. It's absolutely essential um, to leading a, he a healthy, happy life. It's a birthright. Uh, everyone deserves it. It isn't just something for affluent white neighborhoods. Um, but we know that in almost every city, uh, there is an unfair and unjust distribution of nature, whether we think in terms of parks or, or tree, tree canopy, uh, this recent Trust for Public Land study sh showing that in neighborhoods of color, um, parks are half the size if they exist uh, at all. So, so it's a, a really key element, a key plank in our vision of what a biophilic city is. Um, we often talk about just biophilia or biophilic equity. Um, so uh, what, are, uh, what are cities doing? There are wonderful uh, uh, examples of cities that have put that, that issue uh, at, at the fore. Um, uh, Richmond, Virginia, for example, a relatively new member of our, of our network there. They have a draft, uh, a new draft of their comprehensive plan that establishes the goal of having a park or green space within a 10 minute walk for ev every person living uh, in, in that city. And already they've done a wonderful job uh, through a riverfront master plan of, of uh, opening up the river and, and getting folks that direct physical and visual connection to water, which is really important. Milwaukee. Um, has this wonderful program called Homegrown, where they're taking vacant lots and in underserved neighborhoods and, and combining them and, and creating pocket parks and, and community orchards. The image on the screen here is, is back to uh, Portland and the wonderful story of Cully Park. And, and this is a neighborhood of color um, that did not have a park, really. And this is a 25-acre landfill um, that has been transformed into this wonderful park, but it wasn't the parks department doing it from on high, it was the neighborhood. So uh, uh, from the very beginning, there was community engagement uh, and, it's, it's, and community ownership as a result of that. And, and a number of aspects that you see on the screen, the raised bed gardens uh, were actually designed by kids in the neighborhood and, and, and they presented their design. Um, there's a native gathering a garden uh, so there's a deep connection to the indigenous history of this part of, of Portland, but it's a, a wonderful story. We have a, a, a seven minute film on the Biophilic Cities page if anyone's interested in learning more uh, about it. But there are, there are things that cities can and are, are doing to address the, the social equity uh, issue. Thanks so much, Tim. Catherine, uh, tell us about St. Louis and, and what are you doing to address some of these issues? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's critically important that all people have easy access to nature, whether it's enjoying a monarch garden in their backyard, playing in a park, or walking along a greenway. But access to a little patch of grass shouldn't cut it. The goal should be for all people to have access to high quality natural areas. And that typically requires both expanding the amount and size of the green spaces and also working to enhance them so that they include amenities and biodiversity. St. Louisans are actually fortunate in that we enjoy an extensive city park system that makes it easy for 98% of our residents to get to a park within a 10 minute walk. So that's almost double the national average. So there are systemic challenges that we've inherited. And sometimes those show up as disparities in the quality of some of the park experiences our residents have. So how do you go about addressing that? There's some great tools 
that can help identify where to target investments in nature. We also developed a climate vulnerability assessment that links the state of our natural environment to challenges people face, such as extreme heat and poor air quality. We've seen that subpar situations can result in health issues and disproportionately impact minorities and low-income communities. So I use the information to help prioritize nature investments and direct them to where it can help those who are most vulnerable. And one example is this tree planting project we did in 2018. Now, the city was fortunate. We received a grant to plant trees for triple bottom line sustainability impact. Well, we wanted to plant 500 trees where they would do the most good during the actual planting event, as well as for years to come. So we selected four parks in parts of the city that were experiencing high crime. And we wanted to help build positive relationships among citizens and first responders. So the tree planting events included food and freebies, as well as the opportunity to engage with police and firefighters. We also provided teams from these underserved neighborhoods with summer jobs where they learned urban forestry career skills while earning money. In addition to that economic benefit of those youth jobs, we calculated the environmental impact of planting just those 500 trees as adding approximately $61,000 of value per year and the social impact was harder to put a price tag on, but our evaluation showed the effort was valued by both residents and the grant participants. So it was a great way to address equity and nature of both. Oh, sorry, had trouble unmuting there. Thanks, Kathy. What, what an amazing story. And, and I think the way that you have mapped this uh, is really, really fascinating. Um, so just, it may be one last question to you, Tim, before we turn to the audience. And, and again, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. But Tim, you know, as, as we think about St. Louis and other biophilic cities hit hard by COVID-19, um, I'm wondering if they were, they were bolstered at all by their connection to nature. So in other words, have you seen differences in how biophilic cities are responding to the epidemic, the pandemic, um, compared to maybe other cities? You know, what, what maybe unique opportunities have occurred because of their investment in nature, in, in how they've responded to the pandemic? Yes, yeah, so, so, so we've just actually just started uh, an initiative to try to understand uh, fully how our, our cities in the network and beyond the network have been uh, responding during, in the in the pandemic um, and, and what creative ideas and, and, and policies and initiatives and, and think steps that they've been taking. This is an image actually from, from our partner city, San Francisco. Uh, and, and, and like many cities, uh, they recognize the need to, to reallocate uh, some, some of the space in the city, right? Creating a whole network of slow streets that make it easier for, for residents to get, up, get outside uh, and to enjoy nature um, at a safe distance. And, and so I, I don't think there's any question that cities that ha had more nature have more space um, and they can be very dense and compact cities, um, have, have the ability to, to respond and to, to um, respond more effectively to the pandemic. But we don't really know for sure. And we're just starting this work. But one, one story I will tell, uh, back to our partner city, uh, Singapore. I mean, it's been really interesting to watch their uh, response to the pandemic. And here's a city that aspires to this, this immersive nature um, vision. And they've invested in nature for a long time. Um, it's, a, it's a city, a city state of 5.6 million people but yet they've had tw only 27 deaths from, from COVID. Now, why is that? Well, there are plenty of other reasons. They have a wonderful healthcare uh, system and they're very good at contact tracing and they've, they've taken the virus you know, very seriously. Uh, but I do think there is a strong argument to make that the greener the city, the more natureful, the more biophilic, um, the, better, the more resilient that city will be. Certainly, uh, we know the connection between nature and health, physical and mental health, and those things in turn uh, in, influence how, how successful, how resilient that, that population is and how effective the responses are 
on the part of the city. But the, the longer answer is, I mean, we just don't know yet, but we will know, know sooner, soon, we hope. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so I want to turn, we have a lot of questions from the audience, which is always great. So let me turn to some of those. Um, and uh, I just lost the screen with this. Let me, uh, okay, wait, wait, no, let me not leave the meeting. Um, okay, sorry. Appreciate everyone's patience as we do all, this all virtually. So, um, and these, these questions, th this one is for both of you. So, um, and this is, I guess, particularly close to home. So during COVID, um, there's an increased appreciation for the outdoors, yes. And, um, but it is not a perceived priority for funders. Uh, not so much right now. So the question is, how do we convince funders that outdoor activities are important investments during COVID? Um, Catherine, do you want to start with that? And, and then Tim, you can chime in or? Sure. Well, I think there is a greater appreciation among funders and, and those funders, by the way, can be at many different levels at the local level, uh, state level, regional, national, even global. And uh, I, I think they are seeing those connections I want, you know, going back to that concept of nature needs people, but people need nature, you know, showing, painting the picture and showing that these have nature and the importance of enhancing it, improving it, have direct quantifiable benefits for people. This helps move the mission outside of the sort of typical environmental organizations into those who do embrace health and well-being and um, triple bottom line and social issues. So uh, I think, you know, focusing or adding the, the, the dimension of what the impact is on people is uh, an additional way to perhaps speak to people who focus on those issues. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And I'll just, just add, add to that. I, I think there, there are a, a number of ways we can argue for um, more nature uh, in, in the cities. And uh, there clearly are, are significant economic benefits. We have a, a colleague, Bill Browning, uh, Terrapin Bright Green, who's written this book or this report, the, the Economics of Biophilia. When you start to sort of add up all the, the economic value of all of the, of the ecological services and all the, other, all the benefits provided by having nature in your city, it's, it's uh, really not hard to, to make that economic argument. But at the, at the heart of this, for me, it, it's more of an ethical issue and it has to do with again back to this uh, nature is a birthright and and this is something that we are, are we've co-evolved with the natural world we, we want to be happy uh, we are happiest uh, when we when we have nature around us so in terms of thinking about quality of life um, and, and all of the other um, things that are accomplished you know we're trying to, to tackle climate change so almost anything that we do, to grow more nature, incorporate more nature in the city will help that city to be more resilient. We know urban heat, for example, is a huge uh, challenge uh, now and, 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 and moving forward. And uh, so cities need to, to tackle that. And it's planting trees and it's green roofs and it's uh, per permeable you know, pavements and th things of that sort that do, do lots of things, lots of double duty for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add that in, in our thinking, there, there, there seems to be such a need for kind of a shift in mindset from there being two separate worlds of the human world over here and nature over there. And, and there's just such a need for an appreciation and understanding of, of all of those interconnections, right? Uh, those very, very deep interconnections. And, and I think there's many societies around the world, including many indigenous communities that are showing us that um, every day that, that we can learn from. Um, all right, so to another question. I love this question. Can you discuss how to keep a green vision in mind for regions that have harsh winters? So for example, like Buffalo. So how do you do that? Um, who would like to chime in first? Well, I, I'm happy to start. Um, we, you know, that's one of the, I didn't talk about this in, in defining what a biophilic city is, but I mean, we very much see uh, a biophilic city as one where uh, 
you know, sp people are spending more time outside, right? We've already spent 90% of our day, even before the pandemic, uh, inside. And we want to bring nature inside, and we have to do that. But we've got to get more of us outside. And so we have some really, really wonderful ideas for how to do that, in particular in, at times um, of harsh winters, for example. Edmonton, Canada is the best example we have, I think, in the network. And they have uh, actually developed what they call a winter strategy, which is the, a whole bunch of different things intended to, to get people outside in those harshest, coldest months of the winter. And that means uh, places to go. So they have a, um, they have uh, lots of cities have, um, have uh, highways or, or uh, freeways, they have freezeways. So the idea of being able to escape from your home to your work, um, redesigning spaces. So there are wind breaks and, you know, warming stations and ways to make it um, possible, more comfortable to be outside and enjoying nature. Uh, so there are a lot of things that can, can, uh, can happen in a, in a northern latitude winter city. That's great. Catherine, anything you want to add on that or we can move on as well? I just like the, that quote, I've, um, there's no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing or something like that. So. What a great, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So the next question is, um, so uh, I'll just read it. So I'm curious about the hurdles that cities face when it comes to weaving natural landscapes and the built environment. So connecting those, so like the Singapore example, um, it seems like it would be more expensive to build and maintain. Mm -hmm. How do we advocate for this kind of architecture and design as cost effective and beneficial? Um, Tim, that sounds like a question for you. Uh, sure. I mean, and, and actually circles back in a way to the economic argument for, for biophilia. Um, so the evidence from Singapore is that uh, that, that image of the, of the hotel, uh, the Park Royal Hotel, for, for example, that's a WOHA design project, of, um, a firm based in Singapore that we've gotten to know that does a lot of this work. And they, they tell us that virtually the day it opened, uh, the owners of that hotel uh, doubled the hotel, you know, the room charge. Now we, you know, we want to worry about the cost of hotels and the cost of, of housing, but it, the marketplace is acknowledging actually um, the, the benefit of having that, those green uh, elements. That's, I think, you know, one, one thing to say, um, almost everything that, that Singapore is doing is, again, are things that, that, Pay, pay back pretty quickly, and there, and that's in, in terms of, of cooling, in terms of, of and, and and we should talk about the health, the, the short term and long term health benefits of these kinds of investments, and it may be maybe more difficult to to sort of capture and and estimate those costs, but they they're there and they're very uh, real indeed, um, and and so it's um, not not hard to make those those arguments, I I would say. That's great. Um, Catherine, maybe, maybe um, this is a question that you could start with. Um, how are cities correcting their mistakes, such as, you know, overbuilt parking lots or excess commercial and retail development? Um, they, seem, they seem stuck without a pathway forward. Is that something you can speak to in, in St. Louis? Sure. I mean, I, I'll take it from, from an angle that has worked uh, successfully for us, I think, in St. Louis. And, and really, I, it goes back to you, a bit of an overused saying, but to um, meet people where they are. Um, and, and I think you need to kind of figure out what, what's important to them and what's needed and what's going to resonate. So um, going back to that, that Monarch Garden idea. I mean, it really did start out as sort of a, a tiny little thing, put monarch gardens at City Hall or into fire stations. And, um, you know, a monarch garden to be successful only has to be nine square meters. So, you know, it's really a, a tiny thing. And yet, you know, we, we tapped into something that I think, I, I call it hope. <laughs> People want to be part of the solution. And, you know, you have to just make it accessible to them to, to be part of that solution. 
And, and it started this momentum. And so not only were there gardens in people's backyards and front yards and on the tree lawns, and, but then we got some support and we were able to put in monarch gardens at schools. So we've got 50 monarch school gardens in the city with educator guides. Uh, then we decided to create a, a butterfly byway, basically a pollinator pathway along the riverfront of much larger pollinator habitat. So it's really kind of, you know, starting small, finding what the, the hook is, if you will, making it easy enough to get that, that snowball rolling and, and then building upon it, leveraging it for even greater success is what I would say. I love that. And I love, I love your reference uh, to, to the notion of hope and, and the power of hope. And, and um, we're actually doing some, some work with, with partners on uh, the role of hope in our overall well-being and and i think uh, i think nature plays a very strong role in providing us hope even just thinking about my little cherry tree that will live on long beyond i do um there there is something very powerful there um so we have a couple of questions about water so i wanted to maybe try to combine them in into into one um or so one is sort of how does a biophilic city model work in arid regions in, in regions where there's a lot of water scarcity? And then related to that, how do you, um, how do you incorporate water per se? I mean, Catherine, your backdrop has a beautiful river or uh, creek behind you. Um, how do you build that in, um, uh, uh, it says, do you think water scarcity can be an obstacle to blend nature in the built environment. So if, if you both could maybe speak to water a little bit. And uh, Tim, maybe do you wanna start? Uh, sure, so, so absolutely. I mean, the first thing to say is, is that water is, is one of those uh, biophilic features, right? We, we are drawn to water. We know this, the evidence is, is compelling. Um, and so we, we want, where we can, we want water around us. We're, again, there's not a surprise why we're drawn to, to shorelines and, and coastlines and, and, and oceans. And, um, but you're right. I mean, there are um, places, lots of places in the world where it, uh, it, there are arid environments that water, it's scarcity is an issue. Uh, and so one of our partner cities actually is Phoenix. And so what you can do there is quite, quite different, um, but it isn't any less biophilic or natureful. So what you're what they're planting there very creatively is a lot of xeriscaping, a lot of uh, native plant plants, right? It's mesquites and, and cacti. And um, I have to give a lot of credit to the, the city of Phoenix for bringing a lot of that those native plants into the very center of that of that city. And over a relatively short period of time, they've transformed um, the, the suburban, the landscape and yards, um, you know, from lush water intensive uh, vegetation to, to this more uh, desert uh, climate. So it, it's, it's absolutely uh, possible, but I, I do, you know, it depends on where you are and, and where your cities are located. I'll mention one really uh, inspiring example, which we have another film about on our website, which is a, a water, a conversion of a water, sterile chlorinated uh, central city water feature in, in the Australian city of Perth. And they took this water feature and transformed it into a, a, a native biodiverse wetland. And it is a phenomenal story. And it shows uh, how, in, how, how much uh, impact something like that can happen, bringing a, a bit of water, in this case a wetland, to the center of the city, how transformative that, that can be. Great examples. Catherine? You want to, do you want to speak to water and how you've incorporated water um, in, in some of your work? Sure. I just want to mention quickly a sort of the other end of the spectrum from the arid areas and uh, the need for zero escaping and whatnot. And so here in, in St. Louis, uh, we have actually, we're blessed to be up to the, uh, the confluence of the Mississippi River and the Missouri River. And uh, sometimes that results in flooding, um, stormwater management issues and, and concerns. And so for us, it's sort of an abundance or excess of water that we need to be mindful of. And, and uh, while it's an issue that impacts the people in our city and our infrastructure, it is also an opportunity. So our, our sewer district, for example, has some resources and has been required by the EPA to actually 
take action to address some of these um, stormwater overflows, mine sewer overflow situations. And here's an opportunity. So they have partnered with our Department of Conservation and the city to uh, target areas where those former stormwater issues can now be potential amenities for the community. And in fact, we're prioritizing parts of the city where people um, have been adversely impacted by these uh, you know, basement flooding and whatnot, and, and putting in um, community parks and green spaces. But the key part of this is not putting it in for them, but to work with the community, to hear from the community. What do they want to see there? Because not every, you can't assume that what you think is good for a good fit for that neighborhood is what the neighborhood uh, residents also uh, believe. So taking the time to really work with the community and hear from them as to what would be considered a neighborhood amenity is uh, critically important. We're very lucky to have a number of partners in St. Louis who've been working in that capacity. So, and, and that, you know, brings me to one of, one of the next questions that's come in, which is, you know, as you think about, uh, you know, obviously nature, water access, these are amenities. And, and there is the potential for this to, um, to create gentrification and displacement. And so could you speak a little to how, what you've seen in St. Louis and around the world, um, how cities have approached that issue in order to avoid displacement? Whoever, Tim, do you want to start? Yeah. Well, I'll just say that it's, it's, it, it's probably the, the sing, single most important issue that our, that our network cities are, are uh, talking about and think, thinking about. So, you know, it, uh, our, our, our um, discussion now of projects like the High Line, completely different maybe than, than, than just a few years ago, we recognize that this, these are wonderful green biophilic projects, but they have unintended consequences, right? And this uh, language of, of eco-gentrification um, is now part, part, of our, part of our language. So uh, all of our cities are thinking about how do we bring more nature in, in, into the city and particularly in underserved neighborhoods, but we don't, have, we don't want that, those unintended consequences. We don't wanna see um, displacement. We don't wanna see the price of housing uh, go up. Um, and so we do have some emerging models. Uh, one of them, um, we, we talked about maybe there's a slide for um, the 11th Street Bridge Park in, in Washington is, a, is one really good emerging example. And here they have, um, Washington is a partner city in the network. We're happy to say that this project uh, is not yet built, but they have already developed a, there it is, <laughs> a, um, uh, an equitable development plan uh, to, to be working before it's even constructed so that the neighborhoods around it um, particularly on, this is along the Anacostia River on the east side, benefit from it, right? So that their, um, the, the jobs that are created will go to people in the neighborhood. So there's job training, there's uh, financial support for local businesses, there's uh, now a, a community land trust that is out there securing property as a strategy for protecting affordable housing. Um, that's really, really wonderful. And actually the whole story of how, how this park, this beautiful linear park is, was designed, it was designed through intensive engagement of the community. So I think that's the future. We've got to uh, figure out ahead of time um, and prevent as much as we can those, those kinds of unintended consequences. Thanks, Tim. And, and Catherine, how, what are you seeing in St. Louis? Uh, uh, any sort of lessons that you're seeing, models that are emerging in terms of how to prevent displacement of folks? Well, I, I think it's um, kind of a corollary to that conversation, not so much the displacement, um, but the, the right sizing and the right fit piece of it. And I just a, a quick little story, uh, Tim, as we were talking earlier, talked about we have this remnant tallgrass prairie in um, a, an underserved part of the city and is the last urban prairie remnant anywhere. And yes. so here we came in and we, we, you know, we the conservation people and the municipal do-gooders, whatever, thinking, oh, 
these neighbors are going to love the fact that they have this completely unique, amazing prairie remnant. And so we're going to not only, um, you know, find a way that they can access it, it happened to be within a cemetery and in northern St. Louis. And, and we went to the community and we said, gosh, you guys are so lucky. You've got this prairie remnant. And they said, well, prairie's great, you know, but um, you're talking about putting in more prairie and native landscaping in our neighborhood. And that's, that's nice. But what we really want is a garden. We want a way for our youth to get involved after school and, and do community gardening. And can you help us with that? And of course, we know that, um, you know, certain species pollinators help gardening and come from prairie landscaping. So there's an opportunity to weave these things together. But again, it goes back to the point of it has to be a good fit, and you have to listen to the people within the community to find out what that fit is. I, ha I had the chance to, to visit that, that cemetery at, at uh, Catherine's suggestion. It's a wonderful story, and um, the, the you know, cemeteries are often wonderful places of nature, but this remnant prairie is, is beautiful. I know they've been um, a actively they're doing, doing controlled burns, right, to propagate the plants and keep, keep it going. Wonderful, wonderful story. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And, and, you know, I think what you've both talked about so eloquently is just the need for deep community engagement that, that we don't always, we as outsiders do not always, or in fact, rarely know what, what the right answers are and, and how to engage uh, authentically community members and, 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 um, and, and have them as, as a core part of the decision making process is just critical. Um, so that closes the sort of the Q&A section of, of, of our webinar. Um, I want to encourage everyone uh, on this webinar that the next time you step outside, I urge you to look around you and explore your own personal connection with nature and your health. And to think about how together we can help everyone to see nature and health and how they are connected and find ways to create solutions to both. Um, I, thank you all for a fabulous discussion, both Tim and Catherine, as well as all the participants. Um, it, it, you know, it was a very thought provoking discussion. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, and as always, we wanna continue the conversation so look for an email with the recording of today's discussion. We hope you will share it with everyone you know and engage with us online using the hashtag global ideas. And I wanna give you a small gift before we part, which is a website that I have just discovered. It's gonna be posted in the chat. Um, and it's a, a website called Windowswap where people upload videos of the view from their window and their video, so it includes sounds and views um, and lots of birds and, and, and nature. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm, I find it mildly addictive. So with that, I wanna thank you again, Tim and Catherine, and to everyone who joined us today. We have a very short survey for you. It really helps us in planning them, uh, planning these webinars. Stay safe. Be well, and I hope to see you on the next Reimagined in America webinar. Bye-bye.